All right, everybody, welcome back. Let's start this lecture with a matching exercise. We're going to match the aphasia type with its correct feature. So as you can see, there's three aphasia types, but there's five features. So you're gonna have to double up on a couple of these. So go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit the pause button. Otherwise, let's look at aphasia and dysarthria. So aphasia is a term describing some sort of language deficit that's characterized by the inability to either express or understand language. Now, this is most often due to injury to the dominant cerebral hemisphere, the dominant, don't forget that. Now, dysarthria is a term describing a motor inability to produce speech. This means this is a movement disorder. There's a couple different types of aphasia. There is Broca's and there's Wernicke's. So let's take a look at those first. So Broca's aphasia is an expressive aphasia that's characterized by the inability to produce language. The Broca area is, of course, in the frontal lobe in the inferior frontal gyrus. Now, Wernicke aphasia is a receptive aphasia. This is characterized by an impairment in the ability to understand. So one is expressive, one is receptive. Okay, so Broca's is expressive, Wernicke's is going to be uh, receptive. Now the lesion associated with Wernicke's is in the temporal lobe in the superior temporal gyrus. Now there's also, of course, conduction aphasia, whose main defining characteristic is an inability to repeat what someone has just said. So unlike Broca's aphasia, which is characterized by non-fluent speech, that's not the case in conductive. Here, you can't repeat what someone has said. Very interesting type of aphasia. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got a multiple choice here with everybody's favorite circle of Willis. So go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've figured out the right answer. Correct answer here is B. So this is between the anterior communicating artery, which is A, and the anterior cerebral artery, which is B. This might be referred to as either a saccular or a berry aneurysm. Now, while this is the most common site of aneurysm formation, it's not the only location, so please do keep that in mind. Now, the thing with this lesion is that you don't usually know it's there until it ruptures, at which point we get an SAH, which, don't forget, causes that really, really severe headache. Oftentimes, people will say it's the worst headache of my life, or they might describe it in a vignette as a thunderclap headache, and uh, you want to make sure that you are aware of the severity of this. So as the bleed expands, this can actually lead to focal neurodeficits, as well as additional symptoms depending on which vessels become compressed. So let's take a look at that now. So if we compress the anterior communicating artery, we'll get bitemporal hemianopia, and that is, is due to the fact that we are compressing what? The optic chiasm. If a rupture were to happen and the ACA distribution becomes ischemic, I want you to watch for contralateral lower extremity hemiparesis and sensory deficits. If we get rupture of the middle cerebral artery, which can be identified here by the letter D, we will see contralateral upper extremity and lower facial hemiparesis, as well, of course, as sensory deficits. And finally, if we get compression of the posterior communicating artery, which can be identified here by the letter F, we'll get the development of ipsilateral cranial nerve 3 palsy, which, don't forget, presents with ptosis, an unresponsive pupil, and an eye that looks down and out. There's another type of aneurysm that I touched on a little bit earlier, uh, known as the Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysm. This is a relatively common type of lesion, and it's associated with something important, something that is uh, chronic and uncontrolled. Do you know what it is? Hypertension. Now, of course, this is going to affect these smaller arteries, like the lenticulostriate arteries. If this happens, it can lead to hemorrhagic intraparenchymal strokes. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got another matching question here. We've got... Uh, the difference between fever and heat stroke and their corresponding features. I want to see how well you know the difference between these two. So go ahead, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've figured out the right answers.
All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit that pause button. Otherwise, let's just take a look at the main differences between heat stroke and fever. This is very commonly tested. Um, now, this is relatively straightforward. Uh, it might not even necessarily show up on your step one exam, but I do know that the treatment modalities for each is very common on the CK exam. But at the same time, this is still you know basic stuff, so you wanna make sure you know this. So first, what is causing each one of these? So in a fever, we've got cytokine activation. That brings us back to our basic sciences, and that happens as a result of something going on in the body, like an infection. Now, the fever is going to be a response to that infection, but heat stroke is usually going to follow excessive exertion in a hot setting. So classically, watch for an athlete playing on a hot day in pads, like a football player, um, or someone just wearing a lot of equipment and not drinking enough water, or just some variation of that scene. So what causes the heat stroke is simply an inability of the body to keep up with the heat and dissipate it from the body. Typically, heat stroke is going to present with temperatures above 104 Fahrenheit, but fevers rarely get that high unless there's something serious going on. Now, complica complications associated with these two are going to vary dramatically because unless we're dealing with someone quite young, the main adverse effect seen in a fever would be a febrile seizure, whereas in heat stroke, if we don't manage this properly, it can lead to CNS disturbances, to end organ damage, respiratory distress, and muscle breakdown. So how can we manage each of these? Well, typically, we can manage a fever with uh, pain and antipyretic medications to bring down that fever, especially if there's an infection. Um, if there's an infection, uh, an appropriate antibiotic, of course, will get rid of that fever. In heat stroke, we need to cool the body down. So implementing rapid external cooling and rehydration is going to be essential to uh, fixing this problem. So, you know, uh, it depends where you are, but, uh, you know, applying ice packs, uh, cold water, ice baths, um, you know, obviously taking off any wet clothes, taking off all those heavy pads. It's really a common sense thing and the setting will really dictate what you do. But just remember, fevers, we can treat with antipyretics and antibiotics if there's an infection. Heat stroke, we need to cool down the body ASAP. All right, let's move on to the next question. We got another relatively big matching exercise, seizures and their characteristics. So go ahead and hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, here is the correct answers. If you have to fix anything, hit that pause button. Otherwise, let's talk about seizures, which are of course a common medical issue. And what does that mean? Their high yield on our exams. Now, before we dive into the different kinds of seizures, let's look at what the most common causes of seizures are by group. That way, if you get a vignette, the first thing I want you to do is look at the age, and that can at least help you narrow down the most likely causes. So in children, watch for febrile seizures. Just talked about that. This is, of course, due to fever. It can also be due to genetic conditions, to trauma, uh, metabolic causes, or congenital causes. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, I don't know that this will come up on step one, but if you do get a case of a febrile seizure, uh, probably step two or step three, they might say, what do you tell the parents? And, and basically what you need to do is just explain what it is, let them know that there is really no long-term adverse effects of this. Now, in adults, the most likely cause of seizure will be trauma, the presence of a tumor, a stroke, or of course, an infection. Now, in the elderly, your most common causes will include stroke, uh, tumors, trauma, metabolic causes, and the presence of an infection. So, kind of similar across the board. Now, let's take a look at the different types of seizure. But first, don't forget a couple of important terms. Epilepsy and status epilepticus. Epilepsy is a disorder whereby someone is experiencing recurring unprovoked seizures. Status epilepticus is a condition where someone has either an ongoing seizure that lasts longer than five minutes or has these recurring nonstop seizures that are likely to result in CNS injury. I, one of the most vivid memories I have of uh, being in rotations is the first time I saw a patient in status. It was frightening to see and very, very uh, traumatizing. So, you know, if you've seen it or, you know, you're going to be in the hospital soon, Keep it, keep that in mind. Um, it's very uh, rough to watch, but nonetheless, uh, we can manage it. So there's two main classes of seizures. We've got the partial focal seizure, and we've got generalized seizures. The partial focal seizure affects one area of the brain and are most commonly going to originate from which lobe? Do you have any idea? The temporal lobe. Now we've got the simple partial seizure. This is characterized by motor, sensory, autonomic, and psychic consequences. 
but the patient maintains consciousness. And we've got the complex partial seizure, which is going to lead to automatisms and impaired consciousness. Now, the generalized seizures, on the other hand, are not going to affect a single area of the brain, but rather are diffuse in nature. Now, the five main types that you need to know for exam day are the absence seizure, also known as petit mal, myoclonic seizure, tonic-clonic seizure, tonic seizure, and atonic seizure. So let's take a look at each type now. The absence seizure is associated, of course, with children who stare blankly into space for usually no more than 10 seconds or so. They typically experience recurring episodes and they have no confusion after the fact. The, uh, this is also characterized um, on EEG by three hertz spikes and wave discharges. Now the myoclonic seizure is characterized by quick and repetitive jerks, while the tonic seizure is characterized just by stiffening. Now a tonic-clonic seizure, also known as the grand mal seizure, and this is typically the one people think of when they think seizure, this is characterized by alternating bouts of stiffening, then movement. Now patients experiencing a tonic-clonic seizure are confused after the fact, post-ictal confusion. They also have urinary incontinence, so you're gonna ask them, did you urinate, okay? They will bite their tongue, so you ask them, was your mouth bleeding? Did you bite your tongue? Was there any pain? always want to ask those questions because it really gives you some insight into what type of seizure we might be dealing with. Now the last type of seizure is the atonic seizure, which of course means the patient loses muscle tone and what happens if they lose muscle tone? They drop to the floor. Now this typically looks just like fainting, but the underlying causes of course are not the same and so we would do an appropriate workup to determine is it a blood pressure problem, is it dehydration, is it hypoglycemia, um, you know, is there some sort of neurological problem, did they have a seizure? That's why we do the workups. All right, let's move on. We're going to now do a series of fill in the blanks that will test your ability to recognize the common findings of our three main types of headaches. So let's dive in. I am going to um, give you a couple seconds with each fill in the blank. You can hit the pause button, try and figure it out, and then you can come on back. So here is your first question. Your options are at the bottom. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer, of course, is migraines. Migraines are, of course, unilateral and quite severe. Now, typically, a patient will complain of a pulsating pain or a throbbing pain, and it's oftentimes accompanied by nausea, vomiting, aura, photophobia, and phonophobia. Often, they'll tell you that a dark, quiet room where there's no sound, there's no light, is the only thing that provides them with any relief, but it doesn't really get rid of the problem. It's just less intense that way. Now, if you're asked, about the underlying cause here, remember that this can be due to irritation of the meninges, of the blood vessels, or cranial nerve five. Acutely, we can manage this with NSAIDs, although they don't typically provide relief for most patients. It's the first thing we'll wanna try. Uh, triptans are more likely to help, and we can also give antiemetics. Uh, things like metoclopramide or prochlorperazine are going to typically help with the uh, patient who has a lot of nausea. And triptan medications like sumatriptan are going to be 5-HT1B slash 1D agonists, and they're going to work by doing a few things. Number one, they're going to inhibit trigeminal nerve activation. They're going to prevent vasoactive peptide release, and they're going to induce vasoconstriction. Okay, remember, uh, vasodilation in the brain, because it's such a fixed space, can cause headache, and so we want to vasoconstrict. Now, that's why caffeine is also very uh, effective at treating headaches, which is why caffeine withdrawal is something you always want to consider when someone has a headache. Um, and that's why caffeine is also in a lot of pain relief medicines, especially uh, headache medicines, uh, because of its vasoconstrictor, vasoconstricting effects. Now, triptans can be used effectively not only for migraines, but we can actually use them for cluster headaches as well. Now, for prophylaxis, the first thing you always want to do is, especially with a migraine, is try lifestyle modifications. Like see if there's something in their life that precipitates a, a migraine headache. You know, they can keep a journal and try and figure out what is contributing to that headache and what causes it and see if we can eliminate that. But if we if that's prove, proven to be uh, non-helpful, insufficient, we can use, this is for prophylaxis, beta blockers, uh, amitriptyline, topiramate, valproic acid, and even Botox can be used. All right, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've selected the correct answer. The correct answer here is tension. So of course, the tension headache is our least painful type of headache, and it's usually going to present with bilateral squeezing pain that is constant in nature. 
Now, squeezing, oftentimes they'll say there's a, like a rubber band around the head. Now, one of the ways by which you can recognize this, aside from being the only bilateral headache of the big ones, is that it's really not debilitating uh, like the cluster or the migraine would be. And it usually lasts anywhere from four to six hours. And unlike the migraine, does not present with photophobia, doesn't present with photophobia, nausea, vomiting, or aura. It's basically just, I've got a, got a headache and uh, you know, I gotta get through my work day, go home and relax. We can manage a tension headache with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, or any other analgesics. All right, let's move on to the next question. Hit the pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, continuing on with the tension headache, we can use tricyclic antidepressants to prophylax if they're getting too frequent and getting in the way of the patient's quality of life. Now, can you name a couple TCAs? I mentioned one uh, in the last uh, answer, amitriptyline. We also have amoxapine, uh, disipramine, and doxepin. Now, don't forget that TCAs are highly antimuscarinic and therefore pose some very unwanted side effects. That is why we don't want to use them if we don't have to. All right, let's move on to the next question. Hit that pause button and then go ahead and uh, come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer is migraine. So back to the migraine headache. Remember, these can last anywhere from four hours all the way up to a few days. And for management of migraine, I talked about this a couple minutes ago. We've got a few options but um, I mentioned those already, so I'm not gonna just repeat myself 30 seconds later. All right, let's dive into the next question. Hit the pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is cluster. The cluster headache is a very painful type of headache and it's characterized by unilateral pain behind the eye and this typically also presents with autonomic symptoms like rhinorrhea, lacrimation, and conjunctival injection. A red eye that is leaking fluid, uh, in addition to pulsating pain behind that eye, is how you should really recognize this and be on the lookout for this. Now, Horner syndrome is also linked to the cluster headache. And of course, it's not enough to just know that, but instead you need to be able to recognize the symptoms of Horner syndrome, and you know what they are. Talked about this many times throughout the lectures. Ptosis, anhydrosis, which is ipsilateral to the lesion, and meiosis. All right, let's go on to the next question. Try and figure this one out. Hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, back to cluster. Cluster can be treated acutely with sumatriptan and 100% oxygen, and we can prophylax with verapamil. And what class of medications does verapamil belong to? Remember, this is a calcium channel blocker. But as always, is it a dihydropyridine or is it a non-dihydropyridine? Verapamil belongs to the class of non-dihydropyridines. Now, do you know the other main non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker? You said diltiazem, excellent job. All right, we have one more fill in the blank question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer is migraine. I hope you got this one right. So if your patient mentions photophobia, phonophobia, or flashes of light, which would typically be indicative of an aura, please make sure that you pick migraine. Now, before we move on, Let's touch on trigeminal neuralgia. This is an excruciating neurological condition whereby the patient gets one-sided repetitive electric shocks down the distribution of the, cranial, the fifth cranial nerve. Um, oftentimes, it can be uh, precipitated and then exacerbated by chewing, by drinking, or just touching the face. And um, if, you, if you were to go on YouTube and, and look this up, people will say that it's one of the, it's just um, pure misery to have this. Um, because it's 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 like you know shocking in your face nonstop and it's very very uh, very very uh, tough to watch. Um, um, this can be managed with uh, carbamazepine, which of course is going to hopefully dampen that um, that nerve activity. All right, let's end that lecture there. I'll see you guys on the next lecture.